Um, this meeting is being okay. Got it. And I guess, um, yeah, I think just putting your questions in the chat's good. But if 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 there's a question that's really going to benefit benefit from the image that's being shown, you know, just go ahead and um, um, you know, make yourself um heard and just just go ahead and just interrupt me and shout out your question um and i think that'll work fine as long as there's not you know too many too many of those and with that i'll just um get started here i guess i'll um i'll turn off my video so you can um focus on the, the images we have um kind of a uh, a collection of images from well a lot of from john skurlock and then um you know a few a few uh, from my own trips so i guess um yeah i guess the first image here is just um it's a beautiful john skurlock black and white and we have dome peak over here the two the southwest summit the main summit Spire Point and um, you know this ridge, a couple of ridges coming off of um, Spire. This one, this one here, this peak stands out quite prominently. I'll, I'll, that's called the um, one-eyed bull. But I have more pictures that'll kind of explain this picture a little better. It's, it's kind of hard to understand exactly what you're looking at. But um, let me just go to the next image here. So let's see here. Yeah, make log, loggy Wernstead would make them a little bigger here. And so in the, uh, let's see, Loggy was a recent immigrant from Sweden and he started working for the Forest Service based out of Winthrop in about 1925. And every summer he'd set out to survey the North Cascades from the, from the highest summits, most of which were unclined at the time. Um, and his resulting map, published in 1931, was the first, you know, even close to accurate map of the North Cascades. So, really, um, really aided the, you know, the exploration of all all those all these unknown peaks. Really, I think at the time, um, let's go a little smaller here so we can go back. So at this, around this time, the 20s and and early 30s, the Northwest climbers were mostly interested in climbing the volcanoes. You know, they were the first, the highest peaks, they were the first climbed. And other than that, the peaks around the Stokholmi Pass area where the mountaineers had their had their lodge is where, you know, all, most of the activity was, climbing activity was focused. Um, you know, the quest to climb Washington's remaining highest unclimbed peaks, um, may, you know, primarily like the 9,000ers, I guess, um you know benefited greatly from from loggy's map and one of the real active climbers at this time was a guy named herman ulrich so that's what i have a picture of here and so herman herman was a um he was a he he was a newcomer to seattle right at this time and very passionate and and um well, he was the first, to, uh, really the first person to start climbing the peaks in the winter. He made a number of uh, climbed uh, winter ascents, first first winter ascents of many of the peaks in the Sepulmi Pass area, and and then you know in the summer, you know he's aggressively going after the unclimbed nine thousand foot peaks. Um, one of these, let's see, when he was on the summit of Mount Buckner, which is one of these nine thousand foot peaks yeah, he was quite taken with the you know the view south which is of course the Tarmian Traverse looking south from Buckner you know towards um Dome Peak Glacier Peak and um one of the peaks he admired admired um he gave the name Mount Formidable which did stick and uh, about this time, uh, Herman wrote an article for the American Alpine Journal, sort of um, letting people know about the North Cascades. And one of the one of the people who really really saw this um, article and really took note was Omi, a guy named Omi Diver. 
And so about this time, well, I think, I guess I shouldn't assume everybody knows who Omi Diver is, but he, um, Omi um, was a very active climber and he had recently made uh, the first descent of Liberty Ridge on Mount Rainier. This is in 1935. And he's one of the, one of the, um, also one of the, one of the people who started Seattle Mountain Rescue. So around this time, um, in Seattle's Ravenna neighborhood, the George Vancouver Rover Clan, an offshoot of the Boy Scouts, was forming, and Omi Diver was their, you know, adult leader mentor. And so um, Omi really got these these kids fired up. And as I once I let's see, I'm gonna go smaller so I can go to the next image. Yeah, I'm gonna show some pictures um, basically of the Ptarmigan Traverse going from south to north, which is the way the original uh, Ptarmigans um, made their traverse. And this was in the summer of 1936. Um, Did I have that right? 36 or 38, I'm, I hope I'm not wrong here at 36, but no minor detail, I guess. Um, so these, these these young men, um, they were teenagers at the time, and they they really didn't have any any climbing gear to speak of. They didn't they didn't own ice axes. They didn't own crampons. Um, and so, what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna um, I'm gonna read sections from an article that Harvey Manning wrote in the '50s where he details. Um, their trip, their day by day trip. So I'll just read here. Day one at Darrington, the Ptarmigans filled out forms for campfire permits. And after scanning them, the ranger who had lived and worked all his life in the in the rough country announced with almost tearful sincerity that their proposed route was utterly and absolutely impossible for members of the human race. In the world of Calder Bressler, this is one of the four original Ptarmigans. Um, said we had considered considerable respect for his judgment but we thought we would find out for certain the first day out of seattle we rattled up we rattled in the model a up seattle river road to sulfur creek and after saddling up our exceedingly heavy packs tramped along that foul smelling valley as far as there was trail and then thrashed a little distance more, spending the night on an island in the middle of the creek. Next morning, we struck out directly upwards out of the valley, toiling through brush, timber, and meadows for seven and a half hours. At about 7,000 feet on the shoulder below the southwest peak of Dome, we found snow for cooking, our gruel, and made camp. So we'll just... Um, um, So uh, again, we're going. We're, we're, most people nowadays go from north to south, but we're going to um, describe it um, from south to north. And so nowadays, people are um, using Bachelor Creek from Downey Creek, um, whereas the Ptarmigans went up, started their trip at Sulphur Creek, which is just a little bit south of, of Bachelor Creek. And so, just a couple shots of Bachelor Creek, which is. Um, basically a, a, a well-traveled trail for about 90, 98% of the way. Easy walking for the most part um, with maybe a little, little bit of bushwhacking um, depending on, you know, changes that happen when we get the big avalanches coming down in, you know, every 10 years or so. So just a couple shots, Basher Creek. Um, Carl, let me know if my voice is not loud enough or if I, or anything that you wanna. I hear you clear, Jim, hear, sound is good. Okay, so Basher Creek, I think you're, you know, 10 or, 10 or more miles up to this point here. And then over the, over down to this um, little lake here. And then um, 
on up to Itzwit Ridge. This is Spire Point here. Spire Point um, was one of the one of the earliest peaks in this part of the range that was climbed. It was climbed a year or two prior to the Ptarmigan Strip. I think um, Spire Point, I'm just, I guess I wanted to show, um, this is from the north, so the arrow here is pointing uh, down down towards Basser Creek, it's Wet Ridge and Cub Lake. And then um, one section of the Dana Glacier and then on over to White Rock Lakes here. And then, yeah. And just sort of an overview of the, of the country. Um, Dome Peak, LeConte, Sentinel, Old Guard. So really, let's see, I guess Spire Point, what you see here, uh, Dome Peak, the two summits of Dome, Sentinel and Old Guard. These were really the only, only peaks between you know, Glacier Peak and, and um, Cascade Pass that had, had been climbed at the time. So the, the, one of the many amazing things about the Ptarmigans was the number of peaks they climbed. They, they actually climbed uh, 13 peaks along the way. And so um, I will, um, Go back to Harvey Harvey Manning's account um, as told to Calder Bressler, um, one of the one of the teenagers on the trip. Day three, the third day, we kicked steps up snow up a snow finger on the southwest peak of Dome, then spiraled west, reaching the summit of Dome, southwest summit by the north face. Here we discovered the east peak of Dome was higher and had a pleasant scramble along the airy connecting ridge, keeping close below the crest on the south side. We descended from the east peak north along the west side of Chickaman Glacier, crossing to the nameless glacier on the west slopes of Dome, now known as the Dome Glacier. And from there over a snow call onto the Dana Glacier, which they descended a ways until they could uh, ascend the, um, I guess the westerly portion of the, of the Dana Glacier to the base of Spire Point. Um, which had, had been climbed for the first time earlier that summer. After the brief but steep and exposed ascent of the east face, we returned to our camp under dome. So day three, they, they climbed, they're, they're camped um, south of where, where most people are today. So they, they're, and then they quickly climbed dome and then they descend the Dana Glacier here. I'm kind of showing you with my mouse a little bit. And then up this westerly portion of the, of the Dana um, to Dome, and then back to their camp on the south side of Dome or southwest side of Dome, I guess. So a, a pretty full day. I think um, I, I know a lot of people in the audience have done the Tarmian Traverse, and, and many others have, you know, just been to the Dome Peak area. And I, I, I think you know you can appreciate. It's um, a fairly lengthy day after you know after a after a strenuous day strenuous approach with you know with must what must have been very heavy packs. Okay, so day four, the fourth day was one of travel rather than climbing. Though in that rough and icy country, one one must do some climbing to do any traveling. We retraced our steps across Dana and the West Glacier of Dome traversing the headwaters, the West Fork of Agnes Creek to a camp on an alpine knob at the head of the South Cascade Glacier. So this is just beyond White Rock Lakes is where they're, where they're camped on day two. Um, I think if I back up a little bit here. Yeah, so they, they're coming from 
they're coming from out of the picture over here, you know, on the southwest side of dome, down the, you know, and then, and then, um, and then across, across to White Rock Lakes, and then climbing up, I don't know, maybe a thousand feet or something, um, up to the South Cascade Glacier here, where they, they've made their camp on day four. Okay. Okay, so they're they're camped like about here. Um, day five and six. Next morning, six mountain goats investigated us as we lay on our sleeping bags, stirring us to action, hoisting packs. We tramped over the South Cascade to Leconte Glacier, immediately north of Sentinel Peak. Sentinel gave us a struggle in the Berg's Run, but no other difficulty. We had sufficient energy in the afternoon for Old Guard and a northward saunter to the top of Leconte and down to a campsite at Timberline. So I think, you know, they've, they've climbed these two peaks here and they've come around here on the Leconte Glacier and up to the summit of Leconte. And then they're not really clear where they camp, tree line, it's hard to say. It could be, you know, it could be possibly still up here on the ridge. Probably, maybe more likely down somewhere near Yang Yang Lakes. Interesting, they don't mention Yang Yang Lakes, but that's all we really know. There's, there's, um, there's a lot of unknowns about the, this, this Tarmigan's trip. This um, account by Harvey Manning probably has the most information, but I, I was able to learn a couple of other interesting bits of information from uh, both John Roper and Harvey, um, um, Harry Majors in particular. You know, one of the really interesting things we learned from Harry was he believes that the ptarmigans only had one ice axe between the four of them. Um, this is he got this in a in a conversation with Omi Diver when he he um, spent time and in, interviewed Omi Diver about quite a number of things. But according to uh, Omi, Omi loaned the, these teenagers his um, personal ice axe um, for for safety. Was what how Omi um, explained it. He didn't think they should be up there without an ice axe. So. For safety, they had one ice axe between the four of them. Let's see. Okay, yeah, that's um, we'll go back to Dome Peak. Basically, this is down in this is the this is the southwest summit of Dome. This is the higher main summit. And the ptarmigans, they are climbed or they're camped, you know, somewhere down out of the picture below the southwest side of dome. So their route probably goes up in here somewhere. They talk about traversing onto the north face, the shadow area, and then up up to the summit down, and then you know across the dome glacier over to the Dana Glacier and then up Spire Point and then and then back to camp over here. Um, so again we're we're going south to north, whereas most people go today go north to south. I think um, my, from my experience on the term in traverse, I think that I've, I think it makes a lot of sense to not try and climb too many peaks or maybe just climb the peaks that um, require, um, you know, ropeless scramble climbing or with the idea that you don't want to, you're trying to pack light and and eliminate the climbing gear, I think, as much as possible. A shorter, you know, less rope, less, less climbing, any rock climbing gear, for example. I think um, the, just wanted to say a little bit about the Dome Peak area where I think there are quite a few nice um, rock climbs. There's, the rock is quite good in this area. And I think, the I've always treated the Dome Peak area more as a as its own trip. I haven't tried to combine it with the Tarming Traverse, and just um, because there is so much there's so much to do just in the Dome Peak area that I found that a good way to 
to enjoy those peaks. So just a couple pictures of dome. These are obviously in the winter, but the winter pictures are helpful too. They 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 show you where where the ledges are and where the low angle sections are. Sometimes this may not be the best example of of that, but so. Yeah, this shows some more of the peaks. This is um, one of the sub one of the sub summits or one of the many summits of the whole entire Dome Peak massif. Um, Dome Peak is this is all part of Dome Peak, but Dome the summit of Dome Peak is just off the picture at the top here. This is the Dome Glacier over here. This is where the Tarmigans would have been camped over here, and then this is where they drop on to the Dana Glacier. And then up over the west portion of the Dana Glacier um, to Spire Point. Dana Glacier here, Dana Gla west portion of Dana. And um, you can see uh, Spire Point. There's actually um, many of these peaks. They have they have numerous summits. There's um, this this right here is is a prominent summit of Spire, as is this one here. And then the ridge coming down off spire. Well, I guess there's two ridges coming off spires, but both of these have have um, attractive summits on them as well. Yeah, just showing um, the main summit of Spire Point. Um, I guess this is the northeast summit. Um, or known, or it's, uh, the first ascensionists, probably in the 70s or 80s, they named this one the Cheshire Cat. This is the upper portion of the Dana Glacier, the west portion, where um, uh, most people uh, coming from White Rock Lakes, they'll they'll um, come up to this pass right at the bottom of the picture, and then that takes them down to its wet red ridge at Cub Lake, and then. You know, out Bachelor Creek. And so, yeah, again, Spire Point here. And West Fork of Agnes Creek, or one of the forks of Agnes Creek. There's a couple forks of Agnes Creek. Um, Old Garden Sentinel, I think they were the, the two of the earliest peaks climbed in this area. They were approached from the east, from Agnes Creek, um, by um, a friend of Herman Ulrich's, um, Robert O'Brien from the Mazama uh, Climbing Club in, in Portland. And so White Rock Lakes, you, you get to White Rock Lakes if you're coming from the north. From up here, where the South Cascade Glacier is, drop down to the lakes, and then you traverse over to the Dana Glacier, which is off the picture. White Rock Lakes will be out of view down, down below here. South Cascade Glacier, South Cascade Lake. Um, the two portions of the Dana Glacier, Spire Point, and this, the arrow shows where you drop down to um, Cub Lake. Um, yeah, the massive Chickaman Glacier and Sentinel, Old Guard, Leconte Glacier. Like, okay, so this picture is from up on Sentinel Peak and this shows the, the Chickaman Glacier and a couple of, it doesn't really stand out in this picture, but some of the previous pictures are one of the summits of Dome called Elephant Head here, has some quite nice rock climbing on it. This, um, maybe I'll go back and get a better picture of it. Yeah, this one right here, this ridge right here is, has a has um, several fifth class pitches. The, the hardest being, um, I think, five eight, and then of course across the Chickaman Glacier, the Gunsight Peaks here, um, more more high quality, solid, you know, clean rock. I guess just another shot of the same thing here. 
And so I, I threw in a couple pictures of some, some climbing that I did in the 80s with my friend Carl Dietrich on one of the Gunsight Peaks. That's what, you, that's what we have here. The, you can see from the rope here, there, it's quite a steep, steep little face. But the rock is is quite good, and the, of course the protection is is for the most part very good too. So just just some enticements to you know to carry some climbing gear into the dome peak area for those inclined. Elephant head here, more summits of dome, the main summit out of view back. Um, this this peak right here, or the yeah up on the ridge from from. Um, Spire Point is known as the one-eyed bull. You can see his eye there, fairly distinctive um, name for this, this summit here. And then, of course, we're looking at the Dana Glacier from White Rock Lakes. And just more views from White Rock Lakes. That, that elephant head, summit of dome here. White Rock Lakes. From White Rock Lakes, you climb up to the South Cascade Glacier, come across some snow fields and, and then on to the LeConte Glacier. And I think this is, um, this is probably worth one of the more challenging sections of the Tarmian Traverse today, um, especially as the glaciers are receding. I think in early early summer or in, in it, it sort of depends on the summer. Every summer is going to be a little different as far as the conditions of the glaciers, but generally this section of glacier is quite straightforward. Um, early season, midsummer. And then, you know, towards the end of the season is where um, it gets more broken up and you can have more, um, more obstacles or I think I've been reading trip reports and most years it's been quite passable. I think there was one year a few years ago where um, they, they descended all the way down below the glacier and then came up, you know, and got on the glacier over, over here. But I think that's the exception, and I think this is um, where most people are still able to go. Yeah, here's the look. This is the area we're talking about again, right here. Just um, heading over towards towards uh, Leconte Peak and and Yang Yang Lakes. This is Leconte Lake down here below the glacier. One thing I, I like to do is I'll start at Cascade Pass and then go out to the middle section of the Tarmac Traverse and then back to Cascade Pass. And so that that eliminates the car shuttle and also you're, you stay, you're up high the whole time. You, you kind of eliminates the long uh, slog out the out, uh, Basser Creek. And there's, there's lots of stuff, a lot of little peaks to enjoy in the middle section here. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, treat the Dome Peak area more as its own trip, Dome Peak back here. Maybe with maybe with more climbing gear. Okay, just the last shot of that area. Again, Leconte Glacier, Leconte Lake, Traverse under Leconte Peak here, and then down to White Rock Lakes. And you see, I've drawn in a couple of lines here. I think um, when, if you look at a map, the, 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 the probably the most traveled way is is up onto the ridge here, and then over the top, a little sub peak here. Although this is this is a very good way to go to. There's little little climber paths um, kind of up through a gully here. Um, yeah, I guess for the most part, 
the Tarmac Traverse is so well traveled nowadays that um, once the winter snowpack melts out back to, you know, like mid July, say or so, other than the glaciers, there's there's pretty well worn path um, between the glaciers. You know, you might you might get get into a little bit of talus here and there, but for the most part, there'll be a pretty well worn path much of the way. And okay, of course, this picture is showing it all with snow. Kind of shows you why the skiers are able to make such good time. They you know they just you know get to a point like this and you know, 15 minutes later, they're over here and put their skins on and back up to another long traverse, descending traverse. This is this is where White Rock Lakes would be here. Again, showing those those kind of two routes up onto the ridge leading over to Leconte. And this peak here is formidable. One of the sub some of the, the sub summits of Formidable, you can see it's quite a ways over to the summit of Formidable from Spider Formidable Call. Spider Peak be off off the picture to the to the right. Here's Spider Peak here. Maybe I should go back to the Tarmigans here and see what they're doing. We did five. We did days five and six where they. Climb Sentinel Old Guard and Leconte, and then so day seven, refreshed and stimulated. The seventh day, we rambled along the divide above Flat Creek. So I guess that's yeah, that's here, Flat Creek. To the call between Spider and a peak we called Diver. Though formidable has come to be the accept, accepted designation, so they 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 uh, Herman Herman Ulrichs had, had kind of give, given the name formidable, and you know, you know they weren't really aware of of that, and they um, they called it D Diver after their after their mentor Omi Diver. Um, so. We first tackled Formidable, which gave us a good climb on sound holds. Um, let's see, we're rapidly in the picture. Spider, it was a very different sort of peak composed of crumbly uh, Arco 6 sandstone near the summit. Hand holds disintegrated at a touch, and we virtually shoveled our route upward, acutely distressed by the utter absence of anchors. We were delighted to get safely down Spider, which by general agreement was the most dangerous portion of our trip. Shouldering packs, it, once more we proceeded north along the crest. At one point, the ridge was split by a precipitous notch some 20 feet across, and it took us a little time to climb down into the notch and rope our packs up the far side. So this this description to me just suggests that they may have avoided the red red ledges, uh, possibly um, taking a higher traverse line up more on the ridge above Kool Aid Lake. Um, um, though the day had been long. When we found a good sleeping meadow, we still had a bit of energy left over. And since Magic Mountain happened to be above us just to the east, in the long afternoon shadows, we ran up it and down it. Three peaks climbed that day, all first ascent, Spider, Formidable, and Magic. Um, my own experience with Spider kind of bears out their, their comments. I, I found it quite unpleasant. Um, after, after climbing spider from one of the, one of the north, north face routes and then descending spider, probably somewhere in this area, there, there's, there's an area where there's really no anchors and, and, um, it's, it's not, you're not really, you're not really climbing, but it's, but there's, but if you were to, if you were to lose your balance or something, you wouldn't be able to stop yourself and, you know, you're above cliffs. So it's, um, 
it's not a long section, but it's I, I thought it was quite unpleasant. Probably be a lot less unpleasant with snow. Um, okay. So this is the from the other side. This is the spider formidable call at the head of the middle Cascade Glacier. And this is where you would traverse over towards the red ledges and then beyond to Kool-Aid Lake. And the Tarmings description sound like they were maybe up more on the on the ridge above above where most people go today. This is a view south from the spire formidable call. In the distance, you can see the one-eyed bull there, um, spire point. Um, yeah, the traverse over to the Laconic Glacier. Okay, again, the spider formidable call. And then yeah, I guess this would be the red ledges right here. Um, pretty straightforward ledge here. It's more, the, the bigger challenge is more depending on snow conditions in the gully that kind of leads up onto the ledge. You know, it develops um, some moats uh, later in the summer and eventually I think it melts out completely. Although it, it, again, it depends on, you know, it's year to year. Some years it may last most of the way through the summer and other, other seasons, maybe not. Okay, so yeah, spider formidable call here, and then much is you know uh, Kool Aid Lake be out of out of view back here, and what we have here is the Cache Glacier, the Cache Call, and then the route heading over towards Cascade Pass at the bottom of the picture. So um, back to Harvey Manning's description or Caller Brussler's description. Beginning the second week, our packs, this is days eight and nine. Beginning the second week, our packs were considerably lighter and we were all in excellent condition to cover ground, though our fingers were rather roughened and split. Climbing over Cash Call, right here, we dropped down to Cascade Pass and leaving our packs at a good campsite south of the pass, we set out for the peak we called Elsbeth, named Name them. So this is now known as Johannesburg. So they're um, they're you know, they're making quick time over to Cascade Pass, and then they're going to uh, head out for uh, Johannesburg, which they called uh, Elsbeth, which was the name of their mentor Omi Diver's first wife, who had was recently killed in a seaplane accident. Um, so let's see, they traverse the talus beneath, beneath the triplets. This is above Cascade Pass, hidden for Johannesburg. Traverse the talus beneath the triplets, gaining altitude gradually. Traversed and climbed most of the north face of Cascade Peak, arriving at, the, at last at the call between Cascade and Johannesburg. By now it was late in the afternoon, but any qualms we might have had were dispelled by the mountain goat, which appeared suddenly to guide us. Climbing the cliff west of the call, we followed the goat who kept at a uniform distance of 200 feet, leading us to the summit at 6 p.m. Though now we had a few second thoughts and moved with all possible speed and it was dark before we regained the call. So let's see, let's get a picture of Johannesburg here. Um, I know I'm jumping around back and forth here, but uh, I just wanted to point out this section here from Cascade Pass over to a um, little notch here where you'd get over to the cash call. So this section, this traverse here is pretty steep. Um, these snow fields are quite steep and you can see again, you can see there's, you know, there's cliffs underneath you. So it's, um, you know, you might have to put your crampons on, take them off, put them on, take them off, you know, a few times. 
Same thing with snow, Cascade Pass here, Triplets, Cascade Peak, you know, they're heading over here, heading for Johannesburg. I guess I'm gonna have to jump ahead to Johannesburg, okay. So yeah, from Cascade Pass, they're first under the triplets and now on the north face of Cascade Peak, arriving at the call up and up Johannesburg and down. And um, it's getting late in the day. Um, back to Calder Brussers account. Though now we had a few second thoughts and moved with all possible speed before we regained the call. Rather weary and desperate, we attempted to send the hanging glacier that drops away on the north side of the call. And none of us came away from that evening with any love for crawling around on steep ice by flashlight. I don't think they had headlamps. We were finally, oh, and I just want to remind everybody, they, we think they only had one ice ax. They're, um, they've, They've started down this thing. Um, we were finally stopped by a gaping crevasse that spanned the entire width of the narrow ice torrent and gave it up as a bad job. Back over the call, we groggily struggled and bivouacked in a, spare, a sparse meadow on the south slope, huddled all night over a small twig bar, scorching our hands and faces while other portions of the anatomy froze. At first light, we carefully conducted our stiff bones the long way back to Cascade Pass, circling on the south side of triplets and descending a snow finger between triplets and mix up to our camp. The remainder of that day, we spent dozing and swatting horseflies. So this is, um, this is not an easy peak, um, to say the least. And so this is their 10th summit um since they started their trip um let's see what do i have here okay just another picture of johannesburg here's the the call you know they've 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 kind of approached the call across this north face of cascade peak and then here's the you know the north side where they fumbled around the dark and then back up and then around the south side uh, let's see. Be good. Mm. So, I guess I, I'll back up here real quick. I just wanted to. Uh, so, cash call here. I think now, nowadays, most people, they um, their first day on the Tarmac Traverse, most of them will go over cash call and uh, aim for Kool-Aid Lake down the other side here. And, um, but I just wanted to mention that cash call is actually quite a, quite a lovely place to camp too. It's um, what I like about it is it's up high and high campsites are, are really special. So just a couple pictures from uh, you know, camping at cash call. Looking over towards uh, Forbidden and Sahali and Boston in the background. Sahali Glacier, Cascade Pass will be, you know, out of the picture down here. I guess before I leave Johannesburg, I just wanted to mention that um, Harry Majors, um, in conversation with, um, or letters maybe, with um, Harvey Manning's wife, who had, who had worked with Harvey Manning on the telling of this story, she, she had information from that uh, actually a letter from one of the four ptarmigans saying that at the summit of Johannesburg they had found a my a mining um, medallion or some something left by miners which there's there's no other 
confirmation of this. No one else has ever really found this this piece of whatever it was, but according to Tom Myers, one of the four Tarmigans, um, in a letter to Betty Manning, um, Johannesburg may have been climbed prior to to their ascent. Kind of amazing to think about it. Um, now the yeah, the, evidently the miners were all over the mountain and it's, it's hard to it's hard to picture that. Okay, so let's see, day 10. Our 10th morning, we quickly reached the top of Sahali and con continued under the east face and east face of Boston Peak. Here's their route to the summit on Boston Peak. And shortly found a steep and rotten route to the summit. Um, once down off this horrid heap of low grade ore, we traversed the Boston Glacier to the north face of Buckner. That's kind of this line here, which, okay, here's Boston Peak here, and then here's their, their descent down the Boston Glacier to the north face of Buckner, which they proceeded. Well, let's go back to the, um, their description here. The, uh, we traversed the Boston Glacier to the north face of Buckner. The cliffs gave fairly good climbing until we ran out of rock some 500 feet below the west summit. Cox was elected for the lead. He must have had the ice axe, huh? and manfully hewed 150 steps up steep ice while we rested and offered sage advice and commentary on his technique and choice of route. Um, imagining the West Peak to be slightly the lower of the two, we took a few moments along the easy ridge to visit the East Peak, then glissaded long snow slopes down to Horseshoe Basin. One most interesting attraction which we explored is a mine tunnel which bores through Buckner and right under the Boston Glacier. Out of a miner's night into climbers afternoon shadows, we pulled 2,500 feet out of the basin into Sahali Arm. I think it's actually uh, quite a bit less than that, the, the elevation gain back up to Sahali Arm. And in splashes of sunset color, sauntered along the meadows above Doubtful Lake and dove down the switchbacks to Cascade Pass in last light. Three peaks climbed. Um, so pretty, pretty impressive day, really, especially after, after the previous, what was it, 10 days or Johannesburg the day before with the night out. Um, so um, back to Calder Brester here. Taking stock of our situation over campfire, we found that so many nails had been strewn between Sulphur Creek and Buckner that our that there were not enough triconies among us to equip one safe climbing boot. So they're um, basically he's telling us that their boots are falling apart and their their homemade uh, tricony nails are are falling out. Therefore, therefore there, though our dream plans for this trip had always included Logan and Goody, discretion seemed the better part of valor. And the 11th morning, we began the long haul home. So they didn't do have a car shuttle or anything. They um, hiked back to their car on the Seattle River. Uh, day 11, before starting out, all the remaining salami. We shared all of the remaining salami for it had long since passed its reasonable life expectancy. Cox gulped down his ration, but the rest of us famished though we were could stomach only small portions. A sample was enough and all of us had, but the imperturbable Cox were ill and burped our way down the Stahican to camp at Bridge Creek. Day 12. Next morning, we met some hikers from Seattle who told us they had cached some food up the Agnes Trail and freely gave us full property rights. The 
The vision speeded our steps, but 22 miles later, we were disillusioned to find the cache consisted almost entirely of jello. A quart apiece gave our shrunken stomachs enough solace to allow sleep day 13. The 13th and last day we stormed over Seattle Pass, down Miner's Ridge, down the Seattle Valley, stirring the volcanic dust into great choking clouds that required us to walk at intervals of 100 yards. As always, the final mile was interminable, but at last we spied the Model A. And with one more breath of Sulphur Creek fumes, we were on our way back to civilization and our first meal deserving of the name since Cascade Pass. So, wow, it's, um, I, well, I remember when I first read this um, about 20 years ago, um, uh, Tom Miller um, told me about this article and I, and I looked it up and I, I was quite, you know, tracing their route it's and, and all the peaks and you know having experience on some of these peaks myself is just quite an impressive feat that I don't believe anybody has repeated to this day um I crave I guess just back to day 10 is what I've shown here just the route from Cascade Pass this is kind of the camping area uh, below the Sahali Glacier Sahali, Boston, and then down onto the north side, up the north face, and then there's the route back, back to Sahali and down. We have Mount Goody over here, Logan over here, and yeah, this. Okay, so yeah, that's all I have for the Tarmac Traverse, and um, I'm just ready to have to take some questions or. I think um, maybe after some questions, we'll take uh, we'll have a little intermission so people can run to the bathroom or re refresh their brews or whatever they want to do. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jim. That was great. Yeah, if anyone has a question and wants to either post it in the chat or um, I think it's okay to you know you can you can turn on your audio and and ask your question um, and and we'll. We'll go through the time again, uh, traverse questions, and then and then we'll have a, a short break, and then we'll continue with the the two. So yeah, who has a question about the Tarmian traverse, or who wants to uh, maybe tell us a little bit of their own experiences on the Tarmian traverse? So uh, there is a question from Craig. Craig asks, do you have the uh, American Alpine Journal reference for Harvey Manning's article? Okay, yeah, so it's not actually the, um, it's not actually the American Alpine Journal, it's the, it's the Mountaineer Annual, which um, are online, and you can just search Mountaineer Annuals, and then you'll want the 1958 Annual, which may be actually uh, in maybe mislabeled as the 57 annual i forget but either go to the 57 or the 58 and look for the article by harvey manning the title of the article is the ptarmigans and their p trips and it details uh, their ptarmigan traverse but also their trip into the northern pickets where they made the first ascent of mount fury um a trip that hard to believe this but it's it's almost more it's almost more amazing than their charming and traverse their route into the um the north side of fury um luna creek the route they took was over hannigan pass down the other side down the chilliwack river um up over over the ridge near Indian Peak or Bear Mountain somewhere, and then down um, into the creek. I have to look at a map to see which one. And then, well, yeah, up and over a couple ridges, <laughs> you know, with no trails, you know, down big elevation gains and loss. And then uh, over to eventually to Beaver Pass, and then down to Luna Creek, up Luna Creek, 
and then up a route on uh, kind of on the north side of um, Fury and then traversing around to the to the east side. Probably a route that also is has probably not been repeated to this day. Um, the second ascent of the mountain was was made using kind of a variation of their route, but they were some. Yeah, you know, these ptarmigans were, and again, they were they were teenagers at the time. They have to remember and these, you know, these these mountains didn't have roads or trails or names or. Mm -hmm. Um. Thanks, Jim. Ian Ian asks. Ian says, "Thanks, Jim. Is the traverse increasingly crowded, like much of the mountains now?" Well, no question about that. Um. Yeah. I think, um, you know, especially, you know, the, the prime season, you know, it's a very short window, you know, you can do it early in season when there's, when there's more snow, which might make some of the travel a little easier, but, um, you know, the waiting for waiting till midsummer when, when some of the winter snowpack melts back really makes a, um, a prettier trip where you can, you can see the glaciers better. And of course the wildflowers and the, the campsites and whatnot. I think um, if I was trying to, to avoid some crowds, I might go later in the season, um, which I think is quite a nice time too. The, the glaciers might be a little more problematic, but shouldn't really shouldn't be too challenging. And you'll have more, you know, a little more talus and scree, but it's a really a beautiful time, time of year for a trip like this, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went in 2019 and we did encounter other parties, but when we made the detour to go to climb Formidable, we were the only party on Formidable, but there are some other folks. Um, Mike asks, what are some of your favorite routes when you are going to Dome Peak area for rock climbing? Well, the Southwest Peak of Dome is really, I think the, you know, it's not the high, it's the, it's not, it's a little bit lower than the other summits. So it, most people just skip it but it's it's really it's really really a fine peak it's um the rock is real nice and um it's it's easy climbing but it's but it's um enjoyable rock climbing and and i would definitely recommend that you know anything over in the gun site range there's there's uh, there's actually four four gun site peaks and most of them have um fairly low fifth class routes to the top and of course there's more challenging routes as well um also this peak i mentioned elephant head a uh, very nice little peak as well um spire point or any of the any of the other sub peaks of coming off a of spire you know the one-eyed bull the, the the other summits of um oh okay the 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 um, German helmet, which is sort of at the northern end of the of um, one of the ridges coming off a of spire point, it's it's uh, not far from White Rock Lakes. So, yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit over there. Mm -hmm. Good ideas. Um, Alexander asks, does any of the traverse go in the winter? And Steve has a related question. When does the Cascade River Road typically open for a ski traverse? Well, I think um, if you're going to do a ski traverse, you don't really need to wait for the road to open. Um, you know, it, it's going to really vary quite a bit year to year. Um, in large part, um, you know, not every year, but fairly, fairly often. Fairly often, I don't know, I just get take a wild guess, maybe every other year or something, or every third year, you get big, big avalanches coming out of Boston Basin that um, bring a bunch of debris down across the road. And that usually takes um, the Park Service a few weeks to, to clear that out. And that, that oftentimes delays um, opening to the very end. But you're only talking about a mile of road travel if you have to walk that. Um, the rest of the road melts out very early in the very early in the year. It's the the, the road is quite low elevation, um, but um, 
What was the question? What's when's the road meltdown, huh? For for skiers? Oh, it has been certainly. It's been done in the winter. Um, I think first back in the '80s, and you know, I I wouldn't say often, but um, I don't really know how often it gets done in the winter. But um, I think it's moderately popular with the skiers more in the spring, certainly. Um, and they, you know, they're able to to really cover a lot of terrain fast and easy. Uh, I remember my friend Don Brooks um, a few years ago, he had his uh, son drop him off at um, Cascade Pass early in the morning and then pick him up at Seattle, you know, River, uh, Downey Creek Trailhead later the same day. And um, so, yeah, if you hit the right snow conditions, you can, you know, that's the, that's the biggest factor on something like that is having the right snow conditions yeah i think the record is under 18 hours now Not well now i mean when the one yeah in the summer you know they they run through it but yeah I but still that. waiting for someone to to cool. do all 13 peaks mm -hmm. uh thanks jim uh are there any any more questions i don't i don't see more coming in so uh, with that, I think we can take a couple minutes break. Does that sound good, Jim? Sounds great. I'm going to get the restroom and re refill my glass. All right. So yeah, everyone, if you want to make a run to the fridge for another, another round, um, and then we'll come back in, in a couple minutes and we'll do uh, a new route on the tooth. Okay.
So Carl, let me know if uh, if the tooth picture is up there or not. Yeah, I see your file folder. You might have to start a new share again once after opening the uh, the picture of the tooth there, east face, and then do a new share. Common. There it is. Now it's on. Now it's now it's ready to go. So Great. let's uh, kick things off. And, and uh, here we are with uh, a new root on the tooth. Take it away, Jim. Okay. Yeah, and I don't have too many here. And um, I think for this one, just um, if someone has a question, just shout it out, okay? So what we're showing here is just uh, the, the upper part of the approach. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this approach. Um, I will point out um, this kind of route goes through this little pass here, which I've always, I, I hear a lot of people call it, refer to this as pineapple pass, but if you're looking the Cascade Alpine Guide, Fred Becky uh, calls this pineapple pass. And this was the name from the original first descent of this, this point here. So we, we kind of, we kind of gave the, gave the pinnacle here a name to kind of help um, whoops so yeah this is just um, the, the gully leading up to the little pass or past the pinnacle you can see the talus field back below this is my partner David Whitelaw um, Dave's one of the co-authors on our book um, uh, Dave and Tom Solseth so I think about five years ago, uh, Dave and I had this idea to uh, make a, a sport route on the tooth. Um, which is kind of a new experience for me. David has quite a bit of experience um, bolting and, and new routing a lot in the Darrington area, but, but a lot of other areas as well. He's, he's, he's actually been quite prol prolific in, up in British Columbia, down Yosemite Valley. He seeks out these slabs and, and typically um, uh, bolts them on lead, which is quite unusual on, on, in the Darrington area um, on the Squire Creek wall, which is, is um, probably Washington's largest you know, granite wall. He's, he's put up a half a dozen roots uh, the longest of which are like 20, 20 some pitches where they're bolting on lead. And then they, on lead, they put in a, a small diameter bolt, a quarter inch bolt, which is easier to hand drill. And then on rappel, they pull it out and they, and they drill the hole up bigger three eighths and they put in a three eighths inch bolt. Now on the tooth, it's quite a bit different than the, than the granite slab stuff he's been doing. This is, it's quite a bit steeper and the rock is not nearly as good. So um, uh, we hiked around to the top and then rappelled down to um, explore and find, find some, some rocks that's solid enough and nice enough for climbing on. Uh, this just shows the approach from the pinnacle, Pineapple Pass, the the south face route. Um, so both of the both of these routes are getting seeing quite a bit of tra traffic, uh, and I think um, well, if, if, if you just want to be well aware of that when you go up there, and just be prepared to be be patient, be slow. You know, give yourself a lot of time if you have to wait behind other parties, particularly if everyone's descending the same route. You could have quite a quite a slow, slow descent. So you just want to plan ahead for that. But it's also worth noting that you can uh, traverse over here and make one short rappel. And then, you know, this is the, the uh, scramble route here, which I've become very familiar with. Um, with all, we made quite a few trips up here to this this little climb with like this six six 30 meter pitches um took us a lot of weekends we we uh, had a little campsite over here and we'd go up on 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 you know every every week sunday and monday and hike up to the top 
rappel down and do our thing with the with the hand drill. Here's here's David at our campsite. A little weenie roast, get some bratwursts. Some of the um, <clears throat> bolting gear. We you know we equip the equip the belay anchors with these with these nice chains. You know, so there's no webbing and you know built around that that you know should be should be should be able to handle handle a lot of a lot of traffic for for a good number of years. Actually, one of our biggest biggest problems up here was um, water. Um, there's no water up here, so we'd have to carry it up from from down below below the talus field or <clears throat> early in the season. There's actually a melt melt a melt snow melt pond that forms up here, and we'd uh, I think um, the second year we didn't finish this route. The first year we had to go back the next summer, and the second year we got up here early in the season and we filled up a bunch of bunch of water, a bunch of bottles with uh, water from this meltwater pond that I think we had, <clears throat> you know, uh, 15, six, 15 or 20 gallon gallons of water cached up here that last us through the summer and into the next summer as we um, we were having such a good time up here that um, we started uh, climbing on some crags south of the tooth on the ridge between the tooth and Denny Mountain. So this is this is just looking up at the the I guess it's the southwest face of the tooth and um, the route kind of goes up up through here somewhere. Here's a little topo that David made. You can see it's pretty much well. It is. It's 100% bolts. You don't need any any rack other than the bolts and and um, yeah, pitch one, pitch two, pitch twos. That's kind of the the most sustained pitch. Has the most bolts on it. Then a couple easier pitches, and then back to pitch four here. Easier pitches, pitch five, pitch five, a little more challenging. A little cruxy section right here that um, goes through, uh, goes over a little roof. And then the last pitch here, all of the pitches are 30 meters. We did that so that, so that you could retreat with one rope. So you wouldn't have to carry two ropes up here. And um, so they're all 30 meter pitches with the exception of the last pitch, which is 60 meters, but there's a wrap station at the halfway point. So you can, you know, you can belay here or you can run it out up to the top. Been reading trip reports and people are uh, wondering where the rappel anchors are at the top. We didn't put any chains in because there's a big horn up there that people use for the south face. You can wrap from that same anchor, use the same anchor to wrap, wrap here. Or you can um, traverse off um, to the to the north, as I mentioned earlier. Um, here's a better picture of the of the face. This this really shows the scramble route here. It's um, it's you know if you climb the route, go you know climb the mountain via this route, then the descent is pretty straightforward. You know where to go. But if you if you've come up you know, the Tooth Ferry or the South Face, it's, it's, you'll want to have some pretty good beta. It's not really obvious what to do. It's pretty obvious to this point here, right up here. You make a little short rappel into this notch. And then from this notch, you don't want to go down this gully. You want to traverse over to the next gully, which leads you down this way. Um, so yeah, the Tooth, our route, the Tooth Ferry, is roughly in this area. And then um, just this last summer, Dave and Bill Anger, they um, put another route, um, all bolts as well, just a little bit harder, some like one pitch of 510, I think. 
kind of climbs up to the left of this big uh, this big gully chimney thing here, and then crosses the chimney and climbs up this face here. We did put in um, a bolted anchor here for rappel, just to make it. You know, there, there's there's natural pro there, but there's there's nothing that, that um, works very easily. You'd have to leave a lot of stuff because the anchors are kind of spread out a bit. So we put we put a bolt in here. And uh, just to make a, a quick and easy, to, just to make this rappel uh, very easy, it's about a, it's like about a, a 30 foot rappel, maybe 40 foot rappel. And then the, 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 the gully down in here where all these trees are, it's actually fairly steep. I, you could, you can easily, it's, you know, it's, it'd be a little, little uh, uncomfortable um, down climbing this. It'd be easy to, to do some rappels off the trees. You know, it's not rock climbing, but you know, there's uh, there's all short steps and there's slippery pine needles, and so that's that's I just kind of mention the you know, don't be shy about um, just making a quick rappel off a tree or something if, if it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, let's see here. So what I've got, what I'm showing here is. Um, When you come, you approach from over here, from the other side, and then you walk around the base of the, the this west face here. And the first thing you'll come to is is a, an old um, Becky route that um, is actually quite a nice climb too. This um, joins up um, up below the catwalk, and that's. That's what you see here. Is there's a, here's a party on it one day when we're walking past, and then you just continue on another another five or ten minutes, and you'll just look for an area that's kind of beat out at the bottom. The route's getting enough traffic here that you, it's um, it's not hard to find the start of the route, and to be sure you're on it, just just you know look for the bolt, the first bolt up there. This is a picture of um, David and Bill's new route. This is their first pitch of their route <clears throat> that I just showed you farther um, farther west on the on the face or farther north. I get to spend a couple days up with up there this summer with them. So this is a picture from the tooth, um, looking over at this this crag that I mentioned earlier, on the ridge between the tooth and Denny Mountain. Denny Mountain is off the the picture to the right, but um, this we've got a half a dozen uh, little sport routes over here as well, some two pitch climbs and um, some one pitch climbs. And here's a couple of pictures from those climbs. On um, yeah, okay, this is um, we started calling this the um, the Bastille. I think uh, the first time we went up there was on Bastille Day, so we thought that would be a good name. Just David on on one of our climbs on the Bastille. Again, all all bolts, no uh, no no natural pro really. And a view of the tooth from over at the top of the Bastille. And just David on the, here's, here's um, kind of looking up on, on kind of the main, the main face. I think we put two or three routes up, up on this face here. Okay, and then uh, yeah, so when we it's been a couple of years now, but we when we completed the tooth ferry, we're pretty happy with how it all came together. We, I mean, the first half a dozen trips, we really had our doubts how this was going to come together if this was going to be a worthwhile effort. But it, it finally came together, and we finished the route. And what I have here is Lauren Allen, one of, one of um, well, I met Allen through the Mountaineers. I mean, uh, Lauren, through the Mountaineers, um, 
She's one of my SIG students and someone who was um, really eager to get on this climb when she heard about it. And, and then she went back with three of her fellow students. And so we have Kelsey, uh, Jacob, Lauren, and Amanda. I'll fire on the tooth fairy. And a picture of Lauren. Clipping a bolt. I don't know why you can't see the bottom of the picture, but. And here they are in their fairy outfits. And a picture of David. Okay, that's that's it for the Tooth Fairy. So yeah, thanks for coming tonight, and and um, yeah, I'll hang around as long as you guys want to answer questions or um, about these climbs or you know any any of the climbs that are in the book or elsewhere that you that you want to talk about. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple questions in the chat about the. Um the Bastille uh, slabs area there. Um, Ian asks about uh, how, how go the pitches on the Bastille? Is it moderate? So maybe a question about the grade there. I think the, they're the... about like five, eight, five, nine. Okay. I mean, and... don't, don't, I mean, I didn't really take any notes and I, you know, you know, everything's well protected. I can tell you that, but um, I don't think there was any five ten. but I, 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 might not be remembering real well. Mm -hmm. And what's the best approach route to the Bastille area? Oh, okay, yeah, so you, um, Mira's question. Yeah, let's. Uh... So basically, um, you go to here and then you drop over the other side, not very far, and then just uh, traverse across the top of the Talos field and then up through some steep woods to the base of the, the Bastille. You know, it's probably, um, it's probably 20 minutes from here. Okay. And John asks uh, what the rock quality is like on the Tooth Ferry. Maybe compare it to the main south face route. Is it better quality or, or is it similar or a little crumblier? Or... I'd say similar. I mean, you know, none of the rock on the tooth is, is what I would consider really high quality compared to, you know, some of the granite areas. But um, it's, it's more than adequate. And on the, on the southwest face or the Tooth Ferry route, um, well, I, sh I should, you know, I think, you know, the trip reports I'm reading, people, people are commenting how nice the rock is on the Tooth Fairy. I find this a little surprising because, um, you know, it's, we, we, we threw off loose blocks and whatnot. And I think um, it's, it is for the most part quite solid, but you're going to see some loose, some loose, rock some maybe some loose holds on the second pitch i want to say and and i also want to just sort of mention that this area between the tooth ferry and the becky root over here there are some really large hanging blocks up there that are certainly going to come down someday and i think that's something to keep in mind for any of these routes, you know, especially a tooth fairy, if you're climbing underneath other climbers, if somebody, you know, gets off route or is, you know, gets into some loose rock, you're, you know, you're, you're right in the firing line. So, um, you know, climbing, under, I think the route's getting climbed so often that it's not unusual for three or four parties to be on the climb at the same time. But I don't, I think if you're going to do that, you, you need to understand that you are at risk, um, you know, from those climbing above you, you know, dropping something on you. Mm -hmm. 
what what gear is needed? How many how many clips does someone need to bring along? How many? You have drives? to look at that topo. I want to say thirteen, but I, 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 maybe it's twelve. Yeah, twelve or thirteen. Yeah. And what are the belay stances like? Are they are there good ledges or? They're small. They're small. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Use a long sling here, or a um, one of those pull those care quick draws with a pulley on it. This is the pitch you're like most likely to have rope drag on, especially if you don't use some long slings right at right at the first the first couple bolts. But this the bolt the bolt counter the bolts these X's are the accurate um, number of bolts on this topo. Okay. Uh, any other any other questions about? the tooth fairy or for that matter, anything that you find in this book here, which is classic cascade climbs. If not, I, I do see a lot of folks uh, thanking you for the presentation. And mostly it's a uh, thank you style messages coming through here, but quite a few folks are uh, passing on their thanks. Um, Uh, John asks, what's your favorite climb in the book? You probably have a lot. <laughs> That's probably a tough one. <laughs> um, well, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I like South Early Winter Spire a lot, but um, I just, I, you know, peaks that I've, you know, uh, some of these climbs I've climbed them multiple times. I have to say Mount Stewart having climbed, um, north you know routes on the north side is mount stewart um i i figure like 45 climbs on the north side of stewart the north ridge probably although there's you know that's the thing with the book you know we're trying to sh sh um, show the whole range and just show the different types of climbing you know scramble climbing glacier climbing rock climbing and so a mountain like stewart or to be able to show the whole cascades, we can really only show two routes on Stewart. We, we have to pick two routes. So we pick one rock climb and one snow climb or mixed climb. But it's, you know, we really wanted people to understand that um, most, many of these peaks that we, that we, that we feature, like Stewart, for, I'm using Stewart as an example, there, we feature two routes, but there's, 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 there's eight or 10 or more equally nice routes. And so in the book, we also include a, a um, sort of a, a, a chronolo chronology of the, of the different climbs, you know, by year, just to um, try and show people their, you know, the rest of the mountain, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question about the book. Is it, is it a new edition combining the old volume one and volume two? Or is it a brand new book altogether? It's really a new book. I mean, some of the climbs are are were in were in the previous editions, but um, many of them weren't. And I think um, you know this this book really represents um, more of the range much better than the previous ones. Really um, missed a lot of um, a lot of a lot of stuff. I mean, like Forbidden's another one. In the past, we've 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 featured in the previous books. We featured the West Ridge. We featured the East Ridge. Um, but Forbidden is another peak I've I've climbed many times. And and um, in this book, we feature the North Ridge, 
but really there's, uh, you know, the West Ridge, the East Ridge, the North Ridge, the Northwest Face, and also the South Face, which um, the, the first four routes I mentioned are, are all fairly popular. The South Face is, um, is pretty much unknown. It, it gets, I, I've never seen a trip report for it, um, but having climbed it twice myself, I think it's a fine route too. So um, yeah, don't get hung up on the featured routes, just sort of use it as a way to introduce yourself to a peak. And then, you know, if you had a good time, go back for another route. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, Rob says he would buy a book if it was all routes on Mount Stewart. I think that's not a bad idea. Uh, maybe <laughs> we'll collaborate with Rob. Uh, so yeah, any other questions from, from anyone still on? I see we have about 30 folks uh, here about uh, anything out of the book or from the Ptarmigan Traverse or, or the Tooth. I think if not, I will, uh, I'm gonna stop recording here.